there's a lot of coaches out there. They want to teach guys how to talk to women. They give them all of these one-liners. But if you're still anxious with no testosterone, those lines are not going to help you. I was interested to find that my testosterone was high. It was above the reference range in the UK. And yet I still had a lot of that anxiety. But when I started to read about DHT, I thought, oh, that's interesting. If guys supplement DHT, they maximize their DHT. They will notice that they feel a lot calmer. If you're going to supplement like a male hormone, then DHT might be a better one than TRT. You can always supercharge the way you feel on testosterone by adding DHT. If you apply DHT cream, directly to the penis. There's a lot of testimonies of guys that's actually growing it. Is this something that is true even if uh, you're older? Hey, this is Elwyn Robinson, creator of the Rejuvenate podcast, Genetic Insights, and Feel Younger. And just want to remind you, first of all, to uh, subscribe, uh, comment on the video, like, share, and if you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or something like that, please leave us a review as well. It really helps to spread the word about the show. So this podcast is uh, all about bringing you cutting edge strategies to rejuvenate, which means to uh, feel younger again. And I'm very excited today to have a guest on who I've been a big fan of for a long time. As you know, I don't just bring on guests just for the sake of it. I bring them on because I'm actually very interested in what they have to say. And this guest is no exception. Um, Hanzamoto is the first person who I came across who was really extolling the virtues of DHT, which is a specific form of testosterone, which has really been much maligned and demonized in most of not just even the mainstream medical world, but really, you know, everywhere until relatively recently. I think its use uh, and awareness of its benefits have, uh, you know, probably gone back decades in amongst certain underground communities. But I do believe Hans is one of the first person who has really uh, talked about you know, the benefits of it publicly and citing actually many, many scientific papers, um, which really make clear the benefits of DHT. So I did an episode about DHT before, but I'm really excited to be able to have hands on to, um, you know, ask some of the questions that I still had about it. And we also ended up talking about prolactin, which is another very interesting hormone, which again, I think has been very misunderstood until recently. So all I would say is um, keep an open mind during this episode, especially the whole DHT issue. I know it's very controversial, but I don't expect you to believe me or Hans or anyone else, but please keep an open mind. And also, please remember when I bring on guests, I don't bring on guests to argue with them. So I think, you know, no one's going to agree 100%. I think, you know, he might have said a couple of things, which I've said something different in previous episodes. That's totally okay. Uh, I bring guests on not to argue with them, but to really because I want to clarify and understand exactly where they're coming from and, and share that with you. And I hope that, you know, with the guests I bring on, even if you are already a big fan of them and you know a lot of their work, that you feel like you've learned something from the interview. And I certainly felt that way, despite being very aware of and having consumed a lot of Hans' work, I still felt like I learned something. But ultimately, remember, do your own research. Ultimately, you're, own, you're responsible for your own health, your own destiny. Um, and so... Uh, ultimately, you know, what you do as a result of this or anything else is up to you. But I encourage you to keep an open mind and really pay attention with this one because I feel it was a really solid, helpful and interesting episode. Very happy today to be joined by Hans Amato, who is the founder of Testo Nation and uh, who is specifically focused on helping uh, men to be optimized in various ways, especially health related. And I'm excited to be speaking to him today because I feel he has a level of expertise on certain hormones that not many people do. And in fact, uh, you know, what he has to say about one of them, especially DHT, is kind of counter to the usual narrative, but I think is, uh, you know, accurate and very helpful from from my experience. So uh, very happy to have you join us today. Thanks for being here, Hans. Absolutely. Thanks. It's my, uh, it's my pleasure. Before we get into... Uh, my questions about uh, DHT and testosterone and prolactin and all that fun stuff. Tell us just a little bit about your background, if uh, you don't mind, Hans. Like, what uh, got you interested in doing this in the first place? Um, and what made you, like, want to uh, specialize in male optimization specifically? Absolutely. All right. So the thing is, like, I didn't even know I was interested in it until I started reaching, uh, researching supplements and I found out that I can increase my testosterone, that I can see, feel better 
And I think a lot of young men that are very naive in the way they feel. And I was one of them, like, you're anxious, but you don't know you could do something about it. Or you, you feel certain symptoms, but you don't even, you're not even aware. It is a negative symptom. You just don't feel alpha like other guys. You, you might look at movies like Chris Hemsworth, like, oh, those guys are such amazing role models. But you don't know that you can change who you are. And that's how I basically started out. And I was like, oh my gosh, there's something like testosterone and DHD and I can actually become more alpha. There's something I can do about this because I was already lifting weights, but it didn't really give me like a confidence boost that I wanted to until I really started focusing on my hormones. And so from there, this is when all of that journey started adding a lot more muscle, becoming a lot more confident, getting rid of my anxiety, got rid of a bunch of health issues as well. And so I think a lot of guys start out by feeling like suboptimal, not manly enough. And this is also why they start the journey. So that was why I started. And I was just so happy to discover this, that I can actually do something about it. And then completely get rid of all of those symptoms, become the man that I'm actually going to be proud of. And what were some of the worst things that you uh, struggled with uh, before you managed to sort things out? All right. So when I just started, uh, I was, as I mentioned, already lifting weight. So that wasn't to me like a, a big issue because I was already like, relatively knowledgeable about them. The, the biggest thing was probably like, I didn't feel macho enough. I didn't feel I have confidence. People didn't respect me. People didn't listen to my opinion. Like I, w- I was so damn anxious all the time. Like I couldn't go up and talk to it. I was like, I don't even know how to create conversation. So this is not just towards women. It was also towards like other men feeling easily intimidated. Like you have to talk to your boss for a race or something like that. Like kidding me? I'm too anxious for that shit. So um, like some stories is like, there was once, um, a period where I was driving the car and at a robot stoplight, there was another guy stop, stopping next to me with his fancier car. And like, I would get like really like sweaty bombs and almost like an anxiety attack. Like this guy is, he wants to dice me. Like he, what if he gets out of his car and wants to come beat me up? Like all of this, like crazy stories that you create in your head or, you know, like a, like a big a guy that's bigger than you walking down the street. It's like, oh, but no, better not make eye contact. What if someone's getting aggressive? Like it's so much anxiety. Uh, all of this neck tension all the time, like pulling your head, like it was awful. That was really my biggest stuff that I felt like I had to overcome. And then there was later on in life that we went through a stressful period, lots of fasting, financial stress, uh, just life stress in general, that I lost like all of my muscle. I gained a bunch of gained health issues in the process, like severe dandruff, gut issues, food sensitivities, like uh, hair loss. There was a bunch of stuff that got worse. And after getting out of that horrible situation, I was able to recover like all of my health issues, grow my hair, gain so much more muscle and strength. And as I mentioned, like, like all of those bad stuff that's happening is even creating more anxiety because you now you don't have muscle, you're unhealthy, you're what I perceive myself to be like a weak human being. There's nothing to be proud of. And then you have to try to, you know, make a living out of that state. It's horrible. So. I'm just so happy to have overcome all of those kind of stuff. Those are the main things that I can think about right now. Yeah, yeah, that, that's certainly very relatable, I think, to a lot of guys. Certainly the anxiety, I suffered with that a lot, um, both in my kind of teens, early 20s, and then also more recently when I had a, like a health relapse. It's funny because you talk about that kind of social anxiety, and I think a lot of people would think that, you know, the solution to that would be a psychologist or maybe like personal development kind of stuff or meditation but actually you went a completely different route focusing as you said on like hormones and you know supplementation and stuff like that so what made you kind of go down that route as opposed to the more i don't know typical route that people go down when they have that level of anxiety i've known that the drugs especially the SSRIs and those antidepressants they are extremely detrimental and most of the time those drugs just numb you and a lot of people's like oh i feel better it's like no you're actually numb you're anhedonic so you don't see the good or the bad, you're just numb. And what was kind of the biggest thing for me is that I noticed early on that food made a really big difference. So if I was anxious, I noticed that I'm also more likely to be cold. My sleep was off. And so if I ate more meat and potato fat with salt, for example, my temperature would go up, I would feel more calm. So immediately it's like, okay, there's a food connection to the way I'm feeling. So I would rather like make sure I'm eating correctly and that will optimize my metabolism and hormones. And therefore, I'm feeling more confident. And I think about this a lot. There's a lot of coaches out there. Let's say there's a Red Bull, the Charisma community. They want to teach guys how to talk to women. They give them all of these one-liners and those kind of stuff. But if you're still anxious with low testosterone, those lines is not going to help you. 
ultimately you want to have high testosterone that is automatically going to put you in a more calm flow state. So that those lines just flow out of you without the need of like memorizing lines like a robot. Mm. Yeah, I 100% agree with you. And I think the fact that you like noticed those correlations between, you know, say your temperature and what you're eating and how you felt and all that stuff at, you know, quite a young age is you know, fairly impressive. Most guys are not uh, self-aware enough of know what's like, what's going on inside them and see the connections between them. So that's that's pretty cool. I know I wasn't as someone who's supposed to be, you know, fairly intelligent. I, I didn't notice any of that until I was well into my 30s. So, uh, yeah, I think you definitely deserve credit for that. Um so, uh, you, you know, you talked about temperature. I know we mainly want to talk about DHT, but it's interesting you talked about temperature there and how you noticed that would kind of correlate with anxiety. And um, I did find you, I think, originally, as probably many people have uh, in the Ray Peak group. Um, what what uh, led you into, uh, you know, finding Ray P and uh, what should be in your experience with, uh, like, applying his teachings? Absolutely. So, uh it originally started with me always being obsessed with bodybuilding. So I was researching Vince Gironda, and one of the supplements he talked about was wheat germ extract, vitamin E. And so I looked for a source of wheat germ extract, and then I came across Tokovit, the products from Georgie um, Hated on the forum. And I was like, oh my gosh, this guy is so knowledgeable, I was just binging all of his content. And I was just consuming a bunch of information when the forum was actually still a good hub for information. And then over multiple years, as I gained my own experience, I did more research. This is when I started creating my own content and started sharing my own experiences and started helping people from there. But that's basically how I came across that form. But I would say like Pete's writing and uh, Hayden's writing, all of this stuff was like really helpful for me. This is, so I, I think I was pretty oblivious as well. And so it was kind of like me reading on that forum of other people's experiences with feeling gold, gold hats and feed the hyperthyroid and gut issues, all of those stuff, because I was an avid reader. I was reading so much. That I was like, oh, yes, that I'm realizing this, I'm realizing that. You become more self-conscious of all of that. So I would say like Pete was really helpful in me to understand a lot of stuff with a metabolism. Um, but luckily, I was never a guy that fell into the traps of doing carnivore or keto or paleo or, or, or some kind of weird diet. I was always more or less following my intuition, like what I enjoyed, if it's like milk or sugar or fruit, you know, those kind of stuff. Um, but Pete was helpful. But I would also say that there's a lot of stuff that I think people take way too far when it comes to Pete's work, like uh, Pufa Voyagen. Um, there's a bunch of stuff that's more relevant than animals. And then when you look at the human evidence, it's like, well, it, it's not exactly the same. You don't have to stress as much about it. So for example, like people's like, oh, I'm not going to eat a lot of protein. It's like, okay, well, that's maybe why your testosterone is low. You're not eating a lot of eggs because of the poop. And it's like, yeah, that's why your testosterone is low. You're not getting enough cholesterol, choline, biotin, zinc, like all of those valuable nutrients. The moment you start eating more protein, you shoot for 150 grams of protein per day. Oh my gosh, my testosterone is doubling. Everything's feeling so much better. So people like shouldn't be taking these teachings too extreme. So I, I think that was my journey as well, like um, becoming too fearful and then letting go of that fear and then experimenting for yourself. Well, so one of the things that I particularly uh, enjoyed about your writings and one of the things that got me interested in DHT is because I I think most guys listening to this know the benefits of testosterone, right? That's fairly well known these days. They may not know as much as you, but you know they've got a reasonable idea. And I too, you know, had a reasonable idea of the benefits of it. But I was interested to find that my testosterone was high. It was above the reference range in the UK, but I think it's probably just top of the reference range, like for a younger person. And my free testosterone was high. And yet I still had a lot of that anxiety that you're talking about and um, all kinds of other issues and i realized it could be down to more than one thing but when i started to read about dht i thought oh that's interesting uh because you had an article i think about how uh it's possible to have high anxiety and still have sorry it's possible to have high testosterone and still have high anxiety and i think you talked about the conversion to estrogen is one factor um but it wasn't even that for me because my estrogen is below the midpoint so but then i tested my dht and my DHT was actually really low. It was right at the bottom of the reference range. And I thought, ah, that's interesting. And it turned out, uh, you know, I have this uh, genetic thing called genetic insights. And it turned out that I actually have this genetic tendency for my DHT to be low. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about DHT. Um, first of all, what is DHT? How is it different from testosterone? Uh, how is it similar? Like, And what does it do in the body? Let's start with that, if that's okay. 
Well, so testosterone, as you mentioned, most people know about this. DHT is a direct metabolite from testosterone. It's created by the enzyme 5-alpha reductase. The molecular structure is very similar. I don't want to get too technical, but in testosterone structure, there's a double bond. That, stru- that double bond gets removed. And so when you look at the name dihydrotestosterone, it's testosterone with two hydrogen groups attached to it. And the structure of testo- testosterone and DHT is different. And Every androgen, because you know about the HEA, the HD testosterone, androstein dial, there's multiple androgens with the same structure, but they have different anabolic and androgenic properties and different effects in the body. So just because they are an androgen doesn't mean it's a good or strong androgen. So DHD, which people say it binds about between two to five times stronger to the androgen receptor, and it stays on the androgen receptor five times uh, longer. Right, it doesn't uh, detach from it as easily, and therefore it signals much stronger on the androgen receptor, giving you those anabolic and androgenic effects. But that's not the main thing, because from DHT you can have different metabolites like three alpha diol, different other like it's a whole androgen pool that's big, and those metabolites of DHT can bind to the, for example, GABA receptor, and that helps you to stay gone. So that's just one aspect of one of the metabolites from testosterone or 5-alpha reductase. Um, and when we talk about, for example, DHT, we have to take into consideration 5-alpha reductase, the enzyme that creates DHT. That 5-alpha reductase doesn't just create DHT. It also converts progesterone into dihydroprogesterone, which then converts into allopregnenolone, which is a very strong GABA uh, positive modulator. So that those two, allopregnenolone and DHT, help a lot with dopamine signaling, making you feel really good, motivated, and driven, and also GABA signaling, helping you to stay gone. So a lot of these uh, agro men most likely don't have enough DHT and GABA signaling. And so uh, if you, if guys supplement DHT, they maximize their DHT or 5 alpha reductase, they will notice that they feel a lot calmer in constraints, not as aggro, because of that GABA signal. This is also what help happen, uh, sorry, helps um, against the anxiety. Yeah, I'm starting to find that. Um, Let's just go back and define some terms in case guys don't understand. So what is androgenic versus anabolic? What what do those terms mean? Let's start with that. Okay, so anabolic is basically just the growth of something. It's anabolic. So um, DHT can be anabolic to, for example, the penis. It makes the penis bigger, especially during puberty, during development. Androgenic is also more or less the same thing where it can um, promote growth of those... um, genital tissues like your beard like that is usually a sign of androgenicity not just anabolism and also like pubic hair growth or body hair growth but i would say like when it comes to beard growth it's a lot genetics as well and so boosting your dhd can help to give you a bigger beard and um maybe a bigger penis right Uh, but a lot of those stuff are genetic you know a lot of guys are obviously interested in this is this something that is true even if uh, you're older like beyond teenage years yes yes it's much less so when you're older like an older man would struggle a lot more to grow his penis than a younger guy like if your androgens is not optimal during puberty you're most likely going to have a shorter penor but if you apply dht cream directly to the penis there's a lot of testimonies guys it's actually growing it and then you can combine, for example, a penis pump and some Viagra to really stimulate blood flow to the penis and apply topical DHT. So now you have a lot of blood flow, nutrients, and the anabolism. This is when you can get really good growth. Excellent. All right. So <laughs> DHT can have you, help you have a big penis. It can help you have a thick, thicker beard. It can help you to be more calm via, you said, the GABA agonism. So GABA, we talked about this on this channel quite a few times, but just to remind people, it's... Uh, like one of the most powerful calming or even sedative uh, neurotransmitters in the body. Um, uh, if you, too much GABA on its own will sedate you, right? But I think the beautiful thing about DHT that you just said there that I want to highlight to people is it's not just GABA, it's also dopamine. So that's not sedative at all, right? So that combination is what gives you energy and motivation and stuff, but also allows you to be calm and relaxed at the same time, right? Yeah, exactly. When we talk about DHT, a lot of people are going to be if they're still listening and they haven't given up and discussed screaming, but DHT is bad. I heard that it's bad. It's so let's address that. Um, I, again, I see this in the comments section these days, both with my own c- c- few videos on DHT and then, you know, other people's posts about DHT. There seems to be a, like a massive argument going on 
about whether THT is actually a good thing or not, or whether having it at high levels is desirable. Like, for instance, when I got my test results back, they always come with a doctor comment, and it just goes, uh, your DHT levels are right at the bottom of the reference range. Great. <laughs> you know, that's all they had to say about it. <laughs> they were happy about that. So um, uh, why do some people think DHT is not good? Um, and what would be your response to them? All right, so the two biggest reasons. Okay, we have... A big reason, number two, is prostate growth. And then we have the biggest reason, which is exponentially more important to other people, is the hair loss, that they think DHT causes hair loss. So let's maybe address the prostate first. So DHT is anabolic to the prostate, but only to an extent, right? It is not going to continually keep on, keep on, keep on growing. There's a limit how much it can grow. And also the prostate is very good at regulating how much DHT and testosterone actually contains. There's a difference between your serum, which is the blood, blood levels of DHT and prostate levels of DHT. That um, you can have very low levels, high or low in the blood, but it stays relatively stable in the prostate. What's really causing the prostate growth is inflammation. Inflammation stimulates aromatase which increases estrogen. Estrogen attracts water, causes that swelling. So usually if someone has high estrogen, they will have more water retention. So there's multiple studies done on this where um, blocking 5 alpha reductase with testosterone or finasteride can shrink the prostate by 10 to 20%, but they, by inhibiting aromatase, you shrink the prostate by 30 to 40%. It's a much bigger shrinking by inhibiting aromatase because you get rid of the water retention in the prostate. And then also estrogen is extremely anabolic as well by fueling cancer growth, right? It's a, it's a prolific growth. It's uncontrolled. And so um, the thing is like you, you don't want to just inhibit aromatase. You want to fix the root cause, which is inflammation because the inflammation is still going to damage the prostate. It's still going to damage every tissue of the body. And that's how you deal with it. There, there are studies where they actually gave people DHT. And if the dose was high enough, it actually shrunk the prostate. Because DHT lowers estrogen by antagonizing it, and that helps to bring down the, the swelling. So very often you will see that older men, when they, let's say, uh, rub some DHT cream on them, either the prostate doesn't change the size or it shrinks. So that's in terms of the prostate. But it, it comes back to like your general health. Before you go on, okay, so let's just go back. So aromatase. So you said when you block aromatase, which is the enzyme that converts testosterone to estrogen, among other things, right? So when you block that, the prostate shrank by 30 to 40%, you said? Yeah, I'm a bit rusty on my numbers, but it was like almost double, if not more, the percentage from uh, finasteride inhibition. Okay, and finasteride is uh, the 5-AR blocker, so it blocks the conversion of testosterone to DHT. So uh, my question is, so fair enough, so if, if that's the case, then obviously estrogen is more of a contributing factor, um, but why does blocking 5-AR um, reduce the size of the prostate at all if increasing DHT reduces uh, the prostate size? So the, the, the prostate is extremely high in androgen receptors, and so which makes it very easy to grow when you provide enough androgens, right? So you can think the same way. What would happen if you cut your nutsack off? You don't have testosterone, right? Your muscles is going to shrink because testosterone DHT is anabolic. What happens when you inject testosterone? You gain more muscle because it is anabolic. It grows. But just because something grows in an orderly fashion doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It's when something starts to grow in an unorderly fashion, such as cancer, which is a bad thing. And that is exactly what estrogen promotes. Okay, I see. So DHT doesn't, does cause some growth, but it's a reasonable amount of growth, um, whereas estrogen causes an unreasonable amount of growth, which is why blocking it is more effective. Yeah, okay, all right, that makes sense. Um, awesome, all right, so sorry, carry on. Are we going to move on to hair, the one that everyone seems to care about most? <laughs> all right, <laughs> this is definitely, every time I, I uh, post something about DHT, I always get in the comments, like, what about hair, what about hair? So um, I'm not going to deny the fact that DHT is involved in hair loss. It is involved, it does not cause hair loss, because there is multiple studies looking at there is absolutely zero correlation between serum levels of DHT and hair loss. So you have to dive a little bit deeper and the connection is really like uh, the DHT levels in the hair follicle that seems to be really involved in promoting hair loss. But I would go even further to say like, okay, why does someone have high levels of DHT in the hair follicle? When you look at multiple kinds of hair loss, but let's just focus on the androgenic alopecia, 
Um, these people do not just have elevated levels of DHT. They also have elevated, oxid uh, elevated levels of oxidative stress and inflammation. So we do know that oxidative stress and inflammation destroys tissue. What would you expect if something is inflamed? You would expect destruction. And a lot of things that, uh, it's something that people don't know about the NAS, right, is that it doesn't just inhibit 5-alpha reductase. It doesn't just lower DHT. It's actually an antioxidant as well. It has antioxidant properties on its own, independent of DHT. I think that's one of the reasons why it works. There's a few other mechanisms as well that I can go into, but I think that would be too technical. But a lot of uh, people- no, I think, I think we want to hear on... that. Sorry, because as you say, it is such a big objection. <laughs> and, and I hear all the time, well, if it's not DHT, then why do things like finasteride work at all? So yeah, let's explain that to people. Okay, absolutely. So finasteride inhibits a methylation enzyme called PNMT. PNMT converts norepinephrine into epinephrine, which is also adrenaline. So adrenaline causes vasoconstriction. One of the causes of hair loss is also not enough blood flow to the scalp. So I think that's one of the reasons why lowering adrenaline, you have less vasoconstriction, more blood flow to the scalp, and that helps to prevent some of the hair loss. That's one reason. Also, there's another study showing that by inhibiting that same enzyme, PNMT, you get an increased production in coenzyme Q10. We know that coenzyme Q10 is extremely important for energy production. It's also a potent antioxidant. So now you can see what's happening. You have more blood flow, you have more antioxidants, all of which is independent uh, from DHT. So when someone comes to me like, what do I do about hair loss? Is first of all, okay, how healthy you are? Um, are you insulin sensitive? Are you, what's your inflammation looking like? Do you have gut issues? And I think like very often if someone starts boosting their DHT while they have inflammation, that DHT might make it worse. If someone is healthy, they don't have the oxidative stress in their hair follicles, they're not going to get any hair loss, right? So I think a lot of people that are resistant to hair loss, even with high DHT, are the people that just have naturally higher antioxidant defense systems in the body that can get rid of the free radicals. So they're more resistant to it. The ones that are not resistant can't deal with the oxidative stress. And this is why they get hair loss. I hope you're enjoying this episode. I just need to take a moment to quickly tell you about a way that you can support the podcast by getting high quality, affordable supplements that Elwin and I personally use, and that's Feel Younger. What I love about Feel Younger is they have great quality products with minimal fillers, but the prices are very affordable. You can call their customer support team 20 hours a day, seven days a week, and in my experience, they're really helpful and friendly. And what I love most of all is the amazing descriptions Elwin's written for each product category about that topic. There's so much information and education on it. I've actually learned more from reading their product descriptions than I have for most articles. So to support the podcast, please use Feel Younger for all your supplement needs. And to let them know we sent you, you can use promo code rejuvenateme for a 20% discount off your first order at feelyounger.net. That's 20% off your first order with promo code rejuvenateme at feelyounger.net. Yeah, I think for me, like I've done tests on this and I have very low inflammation, very high levels of antioxidants and stuff, but I also have very high levels of adrenaline and cortisol. So I think for me, that could be the reason uh, for my prodigious level of hair loss. I've had a lot of adrenaline and a lot of stress for a long time. And as you say, it's a vasoconstrictor. It totally makes sense. Um, and so finasteride is obviously... Uh, not the ideal method of uh, <laughs> resolving that issue of high adrenaline or low levels of antioxidants, right? Um, what would you say would be a better alternative for some men? And I know you have a whole course on this, which we'll talk about soon, but just like a top top three tips or something like that for people to start with. Yeah, but for hair loss, if someone comes to me for hair loss immediately, the first thing I, I go through with them is diet. Like how's your diet? Are you eating enough micronutrients to produce energy and get rid of oxidative stress? And then what does your gut health look like? But I would say like gut health is so important and there are so many hidden issues when it comes to gut issues because I've worked with multiple people that had zero gut issues. They digest their food fine, they have fast trends at time, they have perfect boobs, all of the good stuff. Do a stool test, but bam, lots of pathogenic bacterial overgrowth despite having zero symptoms. So what are the pathogenic bacteria doing? They're creating toxins that are being absorbed into the body, going to the scalp, causing hair loss. So just because you feel healthy, in my opinion, doesn't mean anything if you actually don't do the test to really see what's going on under the hood. So yeah, and, uh, that's, that's where definitely I start. Been another factor testing. for me as well. Sorry, that's been another factor for me: pathogenic yeah. bacteria in the gut as well. Yeah, totally. I'm sure that's one of the other main reasons why I've lost my hair. Um, <laughs> okay, very interesting. So that would be the place you'd start. Um, 
Okay, so back to DHT then. So we talked about a couple of the benefits, but there are actually there are loads of benefits to DHT, right? Would you mind listing some more? So I would say it does affect the cognition and the physical for the most part. So let's just be clear before people start attacking me in the comments about this. There are studies that when you use finasteride, it doesn't seem to really inhibit muscle growth or muscle strength for the most part if you have low-ish levels of DHT. But I also want to point out that just because you measure measure your blood levels of DHT doesn't mean that you know what those levels are inside your scalp, penis, muscle, liver, brain, those other tissue. There is evidence to suggest that if you, let's say, reduce your DHT by 90% in the blood, it's only being reduced by about 50% in the scalp or 50% in the penis or 50% in the brain, right? So I think this is why a lot of people don't necessarily get those symptoms right away. It's because the DHT is still high enough in those organs, not to cause any issues for those individuals. Can you talk a little bit about uh, post finasteride syndrome? Because as you say, not everyone has negative effects of low DHT when they take it, but actually a lot of people do, why it's a thing. You know, uh, if you Google post finasteride syndrome, you can see it's a huge thing that um, is well known. So do, do you mind talking a little bit about that and uh, what it is? Yeah, yeah post finasteride syndrome is uh, multitude of symptoms we can be cognitive so people have anxiety insomnia brain fog they're mentally feeling off physically they're losing muscle and their exercise performance goes to shit and then sexually they get very worry semen penile shrinkage and also erectile dysfunction and specifically loss of sensitivity their penis feels very numb those are i would say like the three main aspects of bfs and i can't give you a hundred percent reason why some people get it and some people don't. I can just speculate. I've recently done a video on the nine main reasons why people get BFS, which is a little bit unrelated to DHT. Some of the reasons include that it messes up your gut. So there was a study where they used finasteride. It did some gut modulation, but the moment they stopped, it really messed up the gut. So this is why it's post, post finasteride, right? It happens after you stop. This is when all the symptoms come because it messes up the gut, create a bunch of inflammation. Then... It also tanks your hormones in the cerebrospinal fluid. So it's, again, like a difference between your blood levels of DHT and then the hormones in your cerebrospinal fluid. So this is the fluid in the spine and also around the brain, not directly in the brain. Like, go and test the steroids in the brain because you have to do an autopsy and that's going to be very uh, unethical unless, like, it's a cadaver, you know what I mean? So um, the, the best indirect measure that they have, have is the cerebrospinal fluid. And what they have shown is like the hormones tank in the cerebral spinal fluid. And I found a very interesting study using dudasteroid. Testosterone uh, was high in the blood. In the cerebral spinal fluid, both testosterone and DHT was rock bottom. So my question is like, if it tanks your hormones in the cerebral spinal fluid, it's going to be low in the brain. Like how do these people not get side effects? So my hypothesis is if you look at the studies of these people that do get hair loss, that are treated with finasteride. Are they overweight? Do they have obesity, diabetes, uh, sleep apnea? Oh, how high is their testosterone DHT? These people are already unhealthy. So if you are unhealthy and you don't have any libido, you're already depressed, are you going to notice that finasteride is making those symptoms worse? Most likely not, because you're already at a bad spot. So I think that's one of the main reasons why a lot of these symptoms go underreported, because these people are like, well, I'm already depressed. You know, like, so it, it's not a new symptom that is being discovered. All right. So we got gut issues. We got the cerebral spinal fluid. Um, it has been shown to increase your serotonin and lower your dopamine. Serotonin also messes with your testosterone and sexual function. Low dopamine is going to lead to low motivation and drive and then also low sensitivity. I'm thinking of the skeptics or the jokers listening and going, all right, well, you're saying all that happens if you stop taking finasteride. Well, why? Uh, I'll just carry on taking it forever then. Does that mean everything's okay? So... Uh, is that a reasonable strategy? Absolutely not. So if you, for example, lower your DHT, DHT, as I mentioned, is highly anabolic to the penis. And so if you lower your DHT in the penis, the, the, what DHT does, it creates new smooth muscle cells from stem cells. So stem cells is a cell that can change into multiple different things in the body, help with regeneration and repair. So now you don't have enough DHT to create more smooth muscle cells. Your penis consists mostly of smooth muscle cells. That's where the blood flows. It helps with the expansion. 
Now what happens instead of creating that smooth muscle cells, it creates a fibrotic tissue that cannot expand. And this is why people get hard flow sets or shrinking or even Peyronie's disease, where it's a little bit of curvature that they get because there's some collagen creation on one side of the meat, right? So um, you do not want to lower your DHA. A lot of people's like, well, DHT is not necessary in adulthood. Well, absolutely it is because these people still get those side effects when their DHT goes to low in the penis. They still get the anxiety and all of those mental issues in the brain when they use finasteride. So this is not safe to use it even in adulthood because as I mentioned, 5 alpha reductase doesn't just create DHT, it creates allopregnenolone. It actually helps to deactivate your cortisol. So you know, imagine like um, your androgen pool is shrinking, but your cortisol pool is increasing. Now you're more catabolic just because of inhibiting 5-alpha reductase. All of these things is not good. And also it has been shown that if you use finasteride, aromatase goes up. So now your total androgen pool again shrinks, estrogen goes up. So now you have high estrogen, high cortisol, low androgen pool. You're not being protected from those kind of stuff. Now you're subject yourself to stress. Maybe you're having financial issues. Maybe you're having relationship issues, some kind of stress. Stress on top of that suboptimal condition. Now you start getting all kinds of side effects. I noticed there's an explosion of you know younger and younger men who have issues of depression, anxiety, and also erectile dysfunction. And I realize there's many factors contributing to that, but I think a significant one is this finasteride. And I also think it's that's why it's more common in the U.S. than most other English-speaking countries, including yours and mine. Uh, because finasteride is just more commonly prescribed over there. Do, do you think it's a significant factor as well? I, I do think so, but I think really the biggest thing that is ha that have been lowering testosterone, because that the main precursor to, this, to DHT is testosterone. So if you have low testosterone, you're going to have no DHT, regardless of what you're taking, right? So That's an important point to mark, just because I'm one of those unusual cases that had high testosterone and low DHT, that's not that common. The much more common thing is you've got low testosterone and therefore you must have low DHT because you don't have enough testosterone to make DHT out of, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the thing is like, when it comes to diet, like what are people eating? They're eating like some kind of junky cereal for breakfast, maybe some kind of chicken sandwich for lunch, and then maybe some home cooked meal. Like where where's the micronutrients to create testosterone or DHT? Like if you're zinc deficient, or uh, vitamin B3, or like any of the B vitamins, you're not going to have the cofactors to create this document or DHT. This is where you, why you end up with these issues. And and also when you go on social media and you have all of these influencers telling you like, okay, you should be eating this and you should be eating that. What do they usually tell you? Well, you should be eating less meat. You should be eating less eggs. You should be eating vegetables, nuts, and seeds. And most of vegetables, nuts, and seeds, they contain natural aromatized inhibitors. Uh, sorry, not aromatized, 5 l for Five alpha reductase inhibitors. Can you can you give a few examples of commonly used foods? Yeah, so a very common one is actually tomato sauce. It's very high in lycopene. Lycopene is a five alpha reductase inhibitor. We have flax, so any kind of soy phytoestrogen can do that. We know that um, most meats, even if you go to the local grocery store, they spike um, like ground beef with soy. Like at least yeah, they do here in South Africa. So um, independent of the the isoflavone content, the the phytoestrogens. Soy still lowers 5 alpha reductase and DHT, independent of the phytoestrogens. So those are two big ones. Then um, you obviously got the, the magic mushrooms that people are using now as lion's mane and reishi are two of the biggest ones. Um, you have flax. Um, you have nuts. Nuts is a big one because nuts contain beta cetosterol. And some of those phytosterols contain, uh, they are 5 alpha reductase inhibitor. So I would say like the more vegan you are, more likely, the lower DHT you're going to have. Is that nuts, all nuts? Is it seeds as well? Walnuts and seeds, like any kind of nut and seed will have different levels of beta cetosterol. So the best thing to do is like, just get a, a like a chart with beta cetosterol content. You will see the, the differences. So like uh, some people have asked me, what, what do I think about avocado? Because it also contains beta cetosterol. The thing is the amount in, of beta cetosterol is much, much, much lower in avocado than uh, nuts. So I would say like, if you do experience lower libido and like lower mood in general after eating nuts, it's most likely the better seed sterile that's lowering DHT for you. Well, I used to have tons of those food. I used to have a lot of soy when I was younger. I used to have a lot of nuts even when I was older. Tomato sauce. A lot of people have tomato sauce with every meal, right? This is like completely normal. Like these days, Italian food, even Indian food, all those kind of cuisines, they put tomato in everything. So yeah, I can see that. I, I knew about the estrogenic uh, compounds in foods. I didn't realize all the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors in foods. That's very interesting. Um, okay, anyway, sorry, Carol. Yeah, uh, to the last one I would want to mention of the most potent inhibitors is also polyunsaturated fatty acids. Um, 
most like linoleic acid, like the, the stuff is like a lot of foods that people eat nowadays, if they go out, those foods that's made, even in a restaurant, if it's supposedly healthy, is made with some sort of nut or seed oil, canola, soybean, corn oil, whatever the case may be. They are very high in polyunsaturated fatty acids that then inhibit 5-alpha reductase. So even if it does, for some reason, have a neutral effect on testosterone, over time, they can also lower testosterone, but they will inhibit 5 alpha reductase and lower your DHT. So I would say those are kind of some of the most common ones. All polyunsaturated fats. Well, as you say, that's a very large portion of people's diet these days, whether they realize it or intend to do it or not. Um, so is that omega-3s and omega-6s? That is both of them. But I, I think omega-6, if I recall correctly from the studies, omega-6s are the, the most potent. The most potent one is GLA, gamma linoleic acid, that you get from, um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking. There was a specific, I think, buckthorn. I'm not exactly sure, but GLA is the strongest. Borage oil, I know, I think starflower or something like that. Because they, they give it to women, right, for their hormones, I guess, because it's, I don't know, estrogen supporting, maybe. Yep. I would say... Um, People might be asking in the comments, so what about eggs? Because eggs is relatively high in linoleic acid and arachidonic acid. I would say eggs is an exception when it comes to that, because eggs is very good at increasing your testosterone. And from my experience, it doesn't seem to lower DHT or some of the... The thing is that I can't taste my DHT here in South Africa, unfortunately. Otherwise, I would have done a bunch of experiments already. But I don't feel like it's taking away those benefits that DHT is given. Okay. Yeah, very interesting. Um, so other benefits of DHT, uh, I think, uh, maybe not as well known. So we talked about anxiety, so that's kind of a more emotional state, but I think it also doesn't have an impact on like, uh, actual mental sharpness, ability to focus and stuff like that. Is that through dopamine or are there other mechanisms as well? Most likely dopamine and then also dopamine converting to norepinephrine. And so those two really work in synergy for motivation, drive, sexual function, libido, desire, those kind of stuff. Um, when you look at herbs that really help with that focus aspect, it's most likely either dopamine or norepinephrine that help with the sharpness and focus. The thing is, I think a lot of people are scattered brain, and this is why the GABA activation really helps you to focus on one task. So you're not scattered brain. Like you can, like for example, if you take Cenobit, which is a dopamine and GABA agonist, it helps you to focus on the task at hand, and it also makes you feel really energized, calm, and good and social. Like a lot of people can use this as a substitute for alcohol, for example. So you can actually feel better. Yeah. yeah, but be careful with fun about, right? Because it's, it's quite addictive. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, better than a lot of drugs that people are taking regularly. Um, okay, so, and what about a lot of people concerned of testosterone, like uh, that it raises cholesterol, or like the impact it might have cardiovascularly. How does uh, DHT stack up in that regard? Like, does it reduce cholesterol or like, it, does it raise blood pressure? You know, was it? It, it depends what you do. If you have like steroids, like DHT steroids, yes, it might increase cholesterol because you're shutting yourself down and then that cholesterol is not being utilized, but that's exogenous hormones. If you're just creating it, your body is utilizing the cholesterol to create testosterone, which is then converting to DHT. So your DHT level um, doesn't, it will not have an effect on your cholesterol. There is actually some studies, but this is only association studies. Um, showing that men with higher levels of DHT, they are more vascularly healthy. They're, um, they're more protected against hypertension, atherosclerosis, cardiovascular disease. Um, I also think of bone disorders. But that, as I mentioned, this is just association studies. But also when they apply DHT topically for these men, there is no increase in the risk of cardiovascular disease or hypertension or, or anything for that matter. It, it is not disease promoting at all. And when I say this, like this is super physiological levels. This is like four to five X, like the upper range. Okay, right. Four to five times the maximum that you would normally see in in, uh, in nature. Okay. Yeah. And so talking about, um, I, I guess, supplementing DAT, I did a video a little while ago that uh, got, became quite popular, although, you know, with a lot of negative comments as well, where I said that, you know, if you're going to supplement like a male hormone, then DHT might be a better one than TRT um, because... You know, for a few different reasons, but one of them is because, you know, the testosterone can easily be aromatized to estrogen, whereas the DHT can't. Um, and it's, it does depend on your goals, right? If your main goal is building muscle, then testosterone is a better, you know, more obvious thing to do. But um, I would say in most other cases, DHT would be preferable if you're going to add an exogenous hormone. That that was That's my opinion. I, I don't think I've changed my mind on that. Uh, what's your opinion? Would you agree with that? Would you disagree? I would say... 
Although I am a really big proponent of DHT, from the studies that I've shown, if they do a testosterone replacement or a DHT replacement, there does not seem to be a benefit with DHT replacement over testosterone replacement. <clears throat> Both of the groups build muscle, they lose fat. But what I have seen is that when they use DHT only, the main does not always get the same well-being enhancement as they would with testosterone. And also, there was one study show, like, looking at sexual function, but this was like an older man. It did lower libido because at the doses that they are using, they are completely crushing testosterone and estrogen and probably DHEA as well. So I don't know if it's directly related to the testosterone and estrogen or if it's related to DHEA because androgens, if you take testosterone and DHT, very often you will shut down uh, not shut down, but you will lower DHEA production. And so if you are on a testosterone, it's important to also use pregnenolone and DHEA or ATG to stimulate the production of that because we know that DHEA does have strong antidepressant benefits, mood benefits as well. And there is very interesting studies because DHEA can be converted by 5 alpha reductase to androsterone. There were studies looking at a testosterone replacement and um, the guys that got an increase in androsterone had the highest libido. The guys that didn't get an increase in androsterone didn't get a boost in libido. So your testosterone can convert into androsterone, but also DHEA is the main hormone that really converts into androsterone and then into DHT. So this is why I'm saying like this whole host of like 5-alpha reduced steroids. It's not just DHT or allopregnenolone. It's like there's a, there's a big pool. They contribute a whole lot to how you feel and how you operate. So that's the problem with DHT is it's too one-sided and it's not allowing, it's actually suppressing the other hormones to some degree. So, but maybe an ideal thing would be to uh, just focus on increasing 5-alpha reductase based on what you're saying, right? Well, from what I've seen is like if people combine DHEA with DHT, they actually feel really good. But um, the thing is like, you can take testosterone by itself. There, there's a lot of uh, TRT guys out there that say that a lot of the reasons why people get side effects from testosterone is based on the injection frequency. They're injecting too infrequent, and because of the fluctuations, this is when they get most of the side effects, which can be mitigated by doing microdosing on a daily basis. Well, at stable levels, this is when you do not get any side effects. So I don't, personally, if someone would tell me which would be the best one, I would say it's really up to you to experiment with and, and go ahead. Because like when you look at all of the more recent studies on testosterone replacement therapy, People lose weight, they become more healthy, they become more insulin sensitive, like all of the good stuff. Obviously, it's not a miracle drug. Like you still have to do all the diet and lifestyle stuff. But I would say like um, you can always supercharge the way you feel on testosterone by adding DHT. Because there's still, still some people that don't respond well to DRT and they still get anxious or some mood disorders. And it might be because their DHT is not going high enough. And so you can always combine like a 50-50 or something like that ratio between testosterone and DHT. We're feeling much better. We're going to take a quick break to share with you one of our amazing sponsors, Genetic Insights. What makes Genetic Insights uniquely valuable is that they test over 83 million different variants, which guarantees a 99.7% accuracy on all of their DNA reports. With over 100 reports available, you get comprehensive insights into what your DNA is telling you about how to optimize your health today and in the future. I found reviewing my results to be incredibly accurate and applying some of the recommendations which are personalized to your individual DNA to be extremely helpful for me and my family. I also loved how easy it was to upload my raw DNA data that I already had from previously using Ancestry.com because Genetic Insights supports uploading raw data from all major platforms. To get your health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and get 20% off today by using coupon code rejuvenate. Remember that supporting our sponsors supports our podcast, which allows us to keep sharing this important information with you free of cost. So go get your Genetic Insights health reports by going to geneticinsights.co and use coupon code rejuvenate for 20% off today. Well, one benefit of TRT, certainly over DHT, is it's a lot easier to get, right? Uh, <laughs> if you do want to have an exogenous hormone, I mean, there's clinics in this country where they'll happily give it to you. It's probably the same in your country, certainly true in the US, whereas DHT is something that's extremely uh, difficult to get. So that would be uh, an argument in favor of just going for uh, the more uh, typical route, I guess, of uh, doing TRT. Uh, what about the conversion to estrogen, though? Uh, are you saying you're not so concerned about that because the 
the levels that people get with TRT are not like super physiological and so therefore it's not such an issue because obviously it is an issue of people taking steroids right when they're when they're or when they're doing very very high levels of testosterone then definitely too much does convert to estrogen a lot of the issues seem to come as I, as I mentioned from the fluctuations you get in hormones so a lot of these what would be perceived as estrogenic effects can be getting rid of by just increasing your injection frequency to three times a week, four times a week, or microdosing on a daily basis for that stability. And the more stable your hormone levels are, the better you're going to feel you're not going to have any estrogenic symptoms. Now, obviously, if someone is just rheumatizing out of control, they will get like mood disorders, more anxiety, um, more likely to have depression, getting man boobs, uh, those kind of stuff. So you still want to make sure your estrogen is in control. Uh, people disagree with the way that level would be. I like a 20 to 1 ratio of testosterone to estrogen. Um, that seems to be the sweet spot because your androgens can protect against estrogenic effects uh, of estrogen. Because like let's say, for example, you inject yourself with testosterone, you can either take a DHT steroid like Mastron or Pimabolin, and that will block the estrogenic effects of testosterone, or you can take an aromatase inhibitor. And I know you're a big fan of not doing any of that and doing it the natural way, and that's exactly what you teach in your course. Um, so we'll talk about that soon. But actually, you've reminded me uh, by talking about estrogen maybe being blamed for things that it's not really responsible for. Uh, one thing that sometimes is responsible for those effects is prolactin, right? And I know that you also have a course on uh, prolactin and how to reduce prolactin. So... Could you uh, talk to us a little bit about uh, prolactin, please? Prolactin seems to be quite interesting. The main antagonist of prolactin is dopamine. And so if people have low dopamine, they will most likely have elevated levels of prolactin. But you can also artificially spike prolactin by doing a workout, uh, masturbating and ejaculating, or stressing. Those are some acute ways how you can spike your prolactin or having a nutritional deficiency for that matter. So always make sure your diet's on point. There, there is some conflicting evidence on prolactin in... Um, a lot of people would say that prolactin is mainly responsible for inhibiting refractory period or, or like elongating your refractory period, lowering libido. But there's also evidence to suggest that it's not the main one that's responsible. And then there was also evidence looking at uh, test uh, prolactin in relation to your erectile function, but it was more like your, your prolactin is like at 14 or 20. So I would say like, as long as you can keep your prolactin under 14, ideally under 10, I would say like, if you're really healthy, it's going to be around seven, minus around seven. If you're healthy, it's going to be around seven. What's the reference range you're talking about? Because we use completely different numbers in the UK. Okay, okay. So the, the uh, reference range goes usually up to 25. If you have over 25, it, you are at risk of having a, some kind of prolactinoma. So this is when they, or sorry, hyperprolactinemia. And this is when they would look into like a tumor or something. Okay. And so, yeah, so, all right. So dope, uh, prolactin goes against dopamine. It may be responsible for a refractory period, but actually you're not sure. What what other uh, causes of extended uh, refractory period have you become aware of? Refractory period is mainly due to low testosterone, low DHT, low dopamine, like all of the good stuff, um, low DHEA. So if your hormones and stress and everything's on, on point, you should not be having a long refractory period. You should be having great sexual function. But that's also highly also dependent on your relationship with your partner. Are you attracted? Like, like how used are you to that partner? There's a very interesting effect. Um, I'm, I can't remember the exact name of the effect, but it was basically like if you they take, take two animals. So the male bears have sex with the, with the female. And then after he got used to the female, the sexual frequency drops. He has a refractory period. But when they introduce a new female, the refractory period is gone. Right. So that's that's one of the effects. Um, I think this is also why porn is so powerful um, negative for a lot of people because you see new imagery all of the time. You become hooked to like new, 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 new. And so your refractory period is very short. A lot of people artificially think they have high libido when in fact they don't. They're just exposed to all of this new stimulus all of the time. And I think like this no fab, no porn is a very powerful, beneficial movement. But um, I just want to come back to like, I'm not trying to say like black is not bad for anything. It is obviously... Like hyperlactin is a sign that something is wrong, but it's more like a symptom in my opinion. And so the way you fix that is by eating right and doing the right lifestyle style. Ultimately, that, that's the simplest thing. I, I'm always going to come back to those. So what's it a symptom of? So other than those things, can you be more specific or go into more depth maybe? For prolactin, yeah. So prolactin would be like man boobs, gaining an excessive amount of fat, having some mental disorders because it relates to having high cortisol and low dopamine. All of which, so you will feel more sluggish, more not motivated and driven. Like what people would be perceived as a soy boy would can also be related to having hyperlactin. Uh, what about thyroid function? Exactly. All right. Thanks for bringing that up. So 
people that are hypothyroid tend to have higher levels of prolactin, and then fixing that can help to bring your prolactin down. But then also T3 is extremely important for producing five, uh, stimulating 5 alpha reductase. You want to make sure your thyroid's on point. You have more testosterone, more DHT, more dopamine, lower levels of prolactin. But ultimately, coming back to diet and lifestyle. Hmm. Yeah. I think that's true most of the time. I have to say, though, having seen people's uh, genetic reports, like there is just variance. You know, people, some people naturally have higher DHT, some people naturally have higher cortisol, some people naturally have higher estrogen or progesterone or whatever. Uh, some people naturally have uh, lower T3, uh, you know, and they're more likely to have hypothyroidism. So um, I think there is call sometimes for, you know, additional support. But I agree that diet and lifestyle is always the starting place, right? <laughs> because <laughs> you don't want to be messing around with those things unless you have to. But but from, from what I've seen is that if, if someone has hyperlactin and they are treating it with carbogalinum or, or bromocreptine, if they don't fix the root cause, because there's always a root cause, you're going to have to be on that drug that does have side effects for the rest of your life. It's not going to fix it. So I would say like very, very rarely does someone have a genetic uh, reason for having high estrogen or high DHT. Oh, sorry, low DHT. Like, yes, there is some genetic mutations, but it's much more rare to have it. And also it's not a black and white mutation. It could be like a 30% inhibition, right? Or a 50% inhibition. Yeah, so yeah, it's, definitely, say it's definitely we, not black and white. It, we're, we're talking about degrees. You know, it's just uh, enzymes are not the exact same speed for everyone, right? For some people, they're faster. And for some people, they're slower. Like Compt, famously, you know, some people are, have fast Compt. They, they clear away stress chemicals quickly. Some people have it slow and most people have it in the middle. The, the, the reason I, I bring up the genetics was because someone told me that in Turkey, Turkey or Hungary, they are known for having a 5 alpha reductase mutation. So people would be saying like, well, they don't have any DHT and they're completely fine, which is not true because if you have a complete mutation, you will not have sexual organ development. Yeah. These people that have a complete mutation is, is not the same as having a partial mutation. Yes, of course. But also it does not mean that the moment you start boosting 5 alpha reductase, most people feel better when they boost 5 alpha reductase. So a lot of people will say like, hey man, my DHT is low, but I feel great. Okay, but how great can you feel when you start boosting your 5 alpha reductors? Yeah, I saw a video of a guy who, um, uh, well, a guy, I guess he was a 20-something-year-old boy who had never gone through puberty um, because he had that genetic mutation. Uh, he never had his penis grow and he never, you know, had his voice deepen and all that kind of stuff, and it completely ruined his life. So, yeah, I'm not talking about that level of mutation. That is very rare. I'm talking about more just where it's a little bit slower, a little bit faster. You know, that, that's, I think, pretty common. Um, okay, very interesting. Um, what are the other root causes of uh, hyperlactin that people should be aware of? I think most people can really like fix it if they optimize their gut health, like see if there's some kind of hidden reason for having like gut issues in, in the gut. That can increase it because you have ele elevated levels of inflammation, you have low androgens, and then you have low dopamine. Um, so if your diet and lifestyle is really on point, you don't have any nutritional deficiencies, and you still have hyperlactin, I would look into, are you training too hard? Are you stressing too much? Do you have a genetic requirement for more of a specific nutrient? Then you could do micronutrient tests like Vibrant Health America and SpectraCell. But I will look at the micronutrients because sometimes your diet's on point. Like I've got many of these comments like, my diet's on point, it's micronutrient dense. I don't. It's not a nutritional deficiency. And then I asked them like, well, did you do a nutritional a micronutrient test. It's like, no, I didn't. Well, did you know that some people need more? And by genetics, you have a deficiency of a certain thing. That's one of, uh, just to say in genetic insights, that's, you know, we have our nutrient needs collection. And yeah, there are people who have needs for not just every vitamin and mineral, but some people have elevated needs for specific amino acids, you know, like mine were uh, tyrosine and lysine, for instance. And then I did a NutriVal, which is something similar to what you said. And sure enough, uh, it showed that I was deficient in tyrosine and lysine specifically, you know? So that's it. Some people just have an elevated need for uh, different nutrients. And some are, some are difficult to get. I think B1 is one example. It's quite hard to get the recommended amount of B1 unless you have a very good diet just in general, which is why they decide to fortify food with it, you know, about 100 years ago in most Western countries, uh, they decide to fortify all grains of it. Um, but then if you have an elevated need, like if you need double what the average person does, it's pretty much impossible to get enough from diet unless you're really, really aware of it and focused on it. Exactly. Especially if someone also has gut issues, because if, you, if you're not digesting your food properly, you, you cannot assimilate those nutrients. If you're not secreting enough uh, stomach acid or digestive enzymes, or if you have some form of bacterial overgrowth, or if you have intestinal inflammation, like people with celiac disease or people that drink a bunch of alcohol, you're doing things that's inhibiting the absorption of nutrients or 
um, you, you can't even absorb the nutrients because you have some inflammation in the intestine. So your, your villi, which is those fingers in the intestine that absorb the nutrients, they are shrunken and small. And so they can't actually absorb all the nutrients from the diet. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Okay, so let's get to the practical portion for people. Um, you've talked a lot about how if you have your basic diet and lifestyle dialed in, then a lot of these problems get resolved. So what would be your advice to people? What does that involve for you? Yeah, what's the kind of typical advice you give to most clients? I know you have more specific advice for every client, depending on what their specific issues is, and you've got specific courses for specific goals and stuff. But what's your general advice that you kind of give to everyone? All right, so simplicity is key. You want to make sure your diet is simple. Okay, I'm going to list it out in steps. Most people on a scale of 1 to 10 are at a baseline of 5. Let's say it's 5. They don't know what a baseline of 10 feels like. So you are doing things that's optimal. You're not eating the right foods and you're eating foods that's not right for you. And so you have to keep things simple, add the right foods, remove the bad ones. And then by keeping it simple, you go to the high baseline. Now you actually know what it feels like to feel awesome. From there, you start adding in more variety because a lot of people is like, well, I don't like eating a restricted diet. It's like, well, sometimes you need to do that just to, to become your better version of yourself. And then you start adding in more variety. But I've often seen this is that when people start adding in more variety, they eat all over the place, they tend to overtime, just go back to this baseline. All right. So that, that's the first step. The second step is when it comes to like the kinds of foods to eat, just stick to animal foods. They are the most micronutrient dense. They contain no anti-nutrients. They're the richest sources of these vitamins and minerals that can be the easiest absorbed. And they're also in the right forms for the body to use right away. A simple example would be, for example, a vitamin B6. So in plants, it's pyridoxine. In animals, it's pyridoxol. And the body uses pyridoxol as the cofactor for many enzymes. So it's already in the right form for the body to use. Another example would be, for example, magnesium. Like where do you get magnesium from? Well, magnesium is like, well, eat your leafy greens, eat your cacao. Well, that is actually very high in phytic acid that binds to the magnesium. So your absorption is what? Like 50% lower, 30 to 40%, right? The magnesium absorption from milk, although it's smaller, is... So 100%, there's no anti-nutrients that binds to the magnesium. So it's smaller, but you absorb all of it. So it's actually equivalent to eating plant food. So I always say, stick to animal foods that you tolerate. That's the third rule. Don't eat anything that you cannot tolerate. And you only know what you can tolerate once you reach that high baseline. And the foods that I recommend is kind of like meat, organ meat, eggs, milk, and oysters, for example. Those are the five big ones. But if you have a sensitivity to those, cut them out. Like maybe you have SIBO, you can't digest the meat properly. It makes you feel off. Or you're sensitive to the lactose in the dairy or the A1 casein. You can maybe try some goat milk or just cut it out for now. Like if you have to keep it extremely simple, beef with some kind of carbohydrate that's easy to digest. Beef and rice or beef and, potato, uh, um, beef and uh, banana. Like those two digest very well. And then literally those two. Like if you want to be extremely elimination diet, you will get most of your micronutrients. It will digest really well. You get a balanced split of macronutrients. And so your inflammation will drop your baseline will increase. You'll start to feel really awesome. And then you can take it to the next level where you add even more nutrient-dense foods like egg yolks, like organ, and like lard, liver, and kidney, those kind of stuff that you could mix into the ground beef. And now you have very high micronutrient intake and everything is running smoothly. And then from there, you can start adding the other stuff. But as I mentioned, like people start to forget about the basics, the more variety they have. And then they gain weight and like, oh, I'm doing the right things. Like, well, if you start going back to the place that you realize, like, you weren't. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, it's amazing how many people do give that beef and rice kind of thing. and Or chicken, you know, chicken and rice is kind of a common bodybuilding thing, although I realize that's, you know, m not as nutritionally good. Um, okay. And so, yeah, it's interesting. When you first said animal foods, I was thinking, well, that's not very rapey other than, I guess, milk because there's no carbohydrates, right? which <laughs> uh, he's a fan of like a quite high carbohydrate diet. And I know you said you you don't go with his orthodoxy anyway because you prefer more protein. Um, so, but uh, but yeah, okay. So some kind of carb that agrees with you and then some kind of animal, animal protein that agrees with you. That's like the minimum, right? Exactly. And so like you mentioned chicken breast, things chicken breast is not nearly as micronutrient dense as ground beef. And ground beef also contains, or just beef in general contains more fat than chicken, for example, that's healthier for testosterone. So, Again, it's balanced protein, carbs, and fats. It's relatively balanced. It's nice. So and yet, I guess you'd have for like a full fat beef, not a lean one, right? Otherwise, uh, there's not a lot of fat if it's lean beef and rice. Yeah, yeah. even 90% is fine. Otherwise, like if you start eating, this is what a mistake a lot of people on the right beef forum community that they do is that they start combining high carb 
like juice with high fat uh, intake, and now your calories are through the roof, and you start getting weight, becoming insulin resistant, which is also not good. So uh, I try to make it easy. I have these simple guidelines, like try to stick to lean, leaner foods, and then try to eat the food instead of drinking it, unless you're calculating your calories, so you know how many calories you're consuming, because it's very easy just to consume too many calories. So follow some guidelines that automatically help you to kind of restrict how much you're eating, so you're not overeating. Okay. Uh, but you, you, I guess you look like you're working out a lot, right? So it's probably hard for you to overeat, or is that not true? Is it still <laughs> easy for you to overeat? <laughs> I, we have this metabolically flexibility thing that I talk about. Um, I don't think that it has been hashed out at all yet in the scientific community. Um, some people have a very flexible metabolism. They can eat up to 4,000, 5,000 calories, and they just burn it, but they never gain weight. They're more like heart gainers. I, I tend to have a very rock solid metabolism. So if I drop my calories, I lose weight. If I increase a little bit, I gain weight. So um, it's kind of like very stable. Whereas these other people, they have to fluctuate from extremes. And that seems to be highly dependent on your non-exercise activity thermogenesis of people that just fidgeting and standing up. They can't really sit and like scratching and like moving a bunch. So that burns up to like 2000 additional calories per day. I don't seem to be a fidgety person. And so my metabolic rate uh, isn't that high because of the need, that activity. So I tend to have to make sure like I'm not overeating. Um, otherwise, yeah, I'm going to gain too much weight. So I have to be sure. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay. And then, so let's diet. What about lifestyle? What's your top lifestyle recommendations for, you know, optimal hormone, male performance, all that? I would say there's a trilogy. Uh, the three most important ones would be some form of activity. So it could be like walking, uh, exercise, sprinting, some, some kind of activity that helps you because like lifting heavy stuff, or just exercise in general can help to improve your androgens. Getting sunlight and then doing some form of grounding is really good. But they, they're they almost like all intertwined because the ultimate thing is like be busy, like do some form of activity uh, in stress management. And, and they kind of like all overlap because like grounding, walking in nature, doing some form of activity, getting sunlight, all of which help with stress management. If you stress, it's going to mess up your sleep. It's going to give you uh, cravings so you eat more junk food. You can again wait, make your insulin resistance. Stress is very bad for testosterone. So the more things you can do to just like remain at a good level is good. So activity help with that, some like grounding. I don't really do like stress management activities except from like just talking with my wife, spending time outdoors, eating the right foods because like foods help you to stay calm. And if you do fasting and like those kind of stuff, it's not the best for stress management. So I, I would say like those are my three main ones. Like a lot of people over overemphasize lifestyle in my opinion. But diet is so much more important. Like they, they, they emphasize sleep. You have to sleep. You maximize your sleep quality. Okay, but how do you do that? You do that with diet. Like if you don't eat enough or you eat the wrong foods, your diet, your sleep is going to be messed up. You got to make sure you hear a diet at some point, right? Like I've had horrible lifestyle circumstances, but still slept well because my diet. And okay, you have to exercise. How do you, how do you have to energy recovery? Diet, 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 diet. It's always diet. Uh, let's go a little bit more into diet then. Is it so important? Uh, do you believe in intermittent fasting, for instance? Is it good to not eat 16 hours a day? Like, let's say you're having your your beef and rice or beef and banana or whatever. When are you having it? How much How much are you having? Like, how do you space it out? I don't think it matters. I don't do intermittent fasting. Uh, some people do benefit from it, but I think that was all the people that have got issues. So the moment you eat, you have the bacteria, the pathogenic bacteria that starts to feed on the food that you just ate. But bam, you're feeling bad. And that's why they fast, to feel clear-minded. Why do some people feel clear-minded when they eat and other people don't? I think it's very much related to either micronutrient deficiencies, they can't metabolize the micronutrients, the, the macros that they're eating, or they have gut issues that's giving them the brain fog. And so I, I think it's up to the individual. Like, I, I don't have like a strong stance on this. If you want to do it, awesome. If you don't want to do it, awesome. I don't care. As long as you're eating the micronutrients, the calories, the macros, those kind of stuff, the basics, you're all good. Okay. Like my opinion, for instance, is I like to eat fairly soon after waking up so that, you know, my blood sugar stays stable, for instance. Like, do you agree with that or do you not do that personally? I do. I do. Um, one of my uh, things that I usually have people do is to start the day strong because um, very often some people's temperature is not ideal in the morning. And because if the temperature is not ideal, you're more likely to feel anxious and depressed and not optimal. You can't focus. You start eating, temperature is going up. You're feeling great. You're feeling motivated and driven. There's really a strong correlation between temperature and the way you feel. And this is why people in the winter are much more likely to suffer from like seasonal affective disorders, which is like depression and like melancholy 
versus the summer. You feel great in the summer because you're warmer. That is one of the big reasons. Interesting. I've noticed the one thing that makes my temperature go down these days is when I don't sleep enough. Um, does that make sense to you? I think it's, again, highly individual. For me, if I don't sleep enough, I tend to get more like stress reactions um, in the past when I was like more unhealthy. Like now I can buff for the stress much better. Um, but yeah, like it's definitely different from individual to individual. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I don't, there's not much else that will reduce it other than uh, like a sleep for me now. It's kind of weird. Interesting. Okay. Well, it's fantastic. I feel like we've packed a huge amount of very interesting education uh, in this. So, um, Hans, you have a fantastic collection of very uh, easy to go through, but again, very packed with information and kind of practical tips, courses. Um, I think the three that I'm aware of that are the most relevant to what we talked about today, actually, maybe there's more than three, but you have a course on increasing DHT naturally, right, without taking any exogenous hormones or anything. You have a course on reducing prolactin naturally, again, without taking those drugs like you mentioned. Uh, you have a guide on overcoming uh, post finasteride syndrome, right? And I know that's something you've worked with quite a few people on over the years. Um, and actually, we talked a lot about diet, so I think you have like a... a, a a guide like how to eat to boost your testosterone. Is that right? Exactly. That's the launch course. Yes. Excellent. So uh, we'll make sure that we have links to all of those in uh, the description, whether you're on YouTube or on Spotify or whatever, it will always be there in the description. So we'll have links to all of those. Um, other than that, where can people find you? What's your website? What's your social media? Uh, how can people uh, learn more about what you do? All right. So if you just type my name, Hans Amato, into Google, you will most likely find me on all channels. I am relatively active on Twitter, posting a lot of YouTube videos about twice a week. And those are the main places I'm active. I also have a bunch of articles. There's a massive catalog of a website called testonation.com. Uh, but if you want to follow my latest stuff, I also have a newsletter where I'm discussing my latest experiments, latest research, all of those kind of stuff. You can sign up or you can just provide a link um, in the description below to sign up. But um, you can yeah, get on my website. Yeah, I'll provide a sign-up link for them. Yeah, yeah. Go, do get on Hans's email list. I've been on it for about a year and he always sends interesting stuff. He doesn't inundate you with stuff. He, I think you send like a, an interesting update once a week or something. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time, Hans, and your expertise. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, I hopefully we can do this again someday. Absolutely, man. Thank you. That was, uh, I enjoyed this a lot and I was looking forward to do it again. So what do you think of that? It's a little bit shorter than our uh, uh, normal episodes, I know, but we just got to the point very quickly, I think. There was some really interesting stuff there that I do recommend that you take action on. I went through uh, Hans's DHT program personally. I thought it was excellent. I plan to go through a couple more of his that we mentioned during the course uh, soon. Yeah, if that calls to you, I would... I definitely endorse and recommend it remember if i have guests on i don't necessarily endorse and recommend everything they say but if i say i endorse them then it's because i mean it um also please if you enjoy the episode leave a comment if you're watching on youtube uh, leave a review if you're listening anywhere else like if you can do that on whatever platform you're on and please more importantly than anything else share it with anyone who you think it would be open to it and you know if you have social media or anything like that share it there as well publicly that would really help us to spread the word and keep us being able to do this podcast and uh, also you know uh, uh, please support us by checking out feelyounger.net and geneticinsights.co for all your supplement and genetic testing needs uh, but for now i hope you enjoyed that and see you next time hey thanks for watching the video if you enjoyed that i recommend watching our latest episode which you can do by clicking above and make sure to subscribe like the video comment and share with anyone who you think might appreciate it thank you